Gate 6, Madame Blavatsky, an initiatic doorway. As you turn to leave the chamber of esoteric personalities, you hear a loud rapping followed by bells. A tingling sensation fills you along with an insatiable curiosity. Suddenly it is 1875 and you find yourself in a strange apartment in New York City. You walk into one of the several parlors or meeting rooms. It is unusually decorated with huge palm leaves, stuffed apes and tiger heads, oriental pipes and vases, cigarettes, Javanese sparrows, manuscripts and cuckoo clocks. You sit on an overstuffed chair and sense a large presence. In your mind's eye you catch sequential flashes of the life of Madame Blavatsky, a supreme initiate. Her personality with all of its peculiarities seeps into you. You hear her voice echo from what sounds like a far distance. Keep the link unbroken. Do not let my last incarnation be a failure. Hence, true genius has small chance indeed of receiving its due in our age of conventionalities, hypocrisy and time serving. As the world grows in civilization, it expands in fierce selfishness and stones its true prophets and geniuses for the benefit of its aping shadows. Madame Blavatsky Madame Blavatsky is an initiatic doorway, a reflection, an objectification and a map or mirror of a process and structure that reflects who and what we are becoming and transforming into. When we contemplate her life stream, we see that the whole of her incarnation was a metaphor for bringing to light a history of our collective unconscious. Madame Blavatsky single-handedly rekindled the esoteric tradition in the West after it had been severely undermined with the rise of industrial civilization in the middle of the 18th century. She was the first to unite the Oriental or Far East wisdom with the Western teachings and place them into a global organization. This was an enormous mission for anyone, particularly a Russian female with English as her third language, in a time when the rights and roles of women in society were still very restricted. In the history of alchemy or Western Hermeticism, much less mainstream culture, there are few examples of women who are literally giants of thought. If we survey the whole of the 19th and 20th centuries, we will unlikely find any other woman, or perhaps man, comparable in the daring, breadth and scope of thought that Madame Blavatsky embodied. She was acutely aware of the imminence of the approaching end of the cycle and that a superhuman effort was required to establish a renewed foundation for the secret doctrine. For this reason, the strength of her personality had to equal that of her mission. Blavatsky's Theosophical Society has its roots in England and India and is still a worldwide phenomenon. Its founding was a global event, an initiatic doorway, that opened into a new age. This was scarcely 137 years before 2012, the closing of the Mayan grid cycle. Blavatsky's ideas are as valid today as they were 120 years ago. Many people failed to recognize her close link with Tibet. In fact, we could say that with the creation of the Theosophical Society, Madame Blavatsky was a Tibetan world reformer. The 14th Dalai Lama says in her book The Voice of Silence, I believe that this book has strongly influenced many sincere seekers and aspirants to the wisdom and compassion of the Bodhisattva path. Madame Blavatsky was highly regarded as she was controversial, enduring much slander in her own lifetime. Many Buddhists did not recognize her as an official Buddhist. She took formal vows and precepts with Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka in 1888, and many religious thinkers did not believe she was a genuine religious thinker, though most acknowledge her astounding accomplishments. To understand the life work of any being within the planetary framework, we must first understand the condition and the time they were born into. From this, we can glean more insight into the meaning, validity, importance and scope of his or her mission. Do not seek the person within the personality, but the cosmic function being performed through that person. Madame Blavatsky was born into the age of industrialization, an age of incredible optimism 
where it was thought that technology would transform the world and that the human would be saved or enlightened by the machine. She was raised in an elitist Russian environment that gave her the privilege to explore the world in a way most of her contemporaries could not. Dane Rudyard said that Blavatsky's world travels were ritualistic methods of a globe encompassing all human awareness, heralding the actual emergence of planetary consciousness. Madame Blavatsky was well aware of the moment she occupied in the evolutionary trajectory, the time of the closing of one cycle and the opening of the new cycle. This was reflected throughout her teachings. She was also aware that she was confronting deeply conditioned belief patterns of the West by introducing Eastern thought. She spoke out strongly against scientific materialism as well as religious hypocrisy. She also knew that the mediumship, psychic powers and oriental perspective, inclusive of her apprenticeship of Master Moria, was flying in the face of conventional Western thinking. This is important to understand. Madame Blavatsky called upon her skill at synthesizing vast amounts of knowledge to describe, define and unify the nature of existence and reality from a spiritual, non-material point of view. She opened a pathway that had been recently shut down, the pathway of the alchemists, hermeticists and Rosicrucians. She was the first Westerner to bring the existence of the Masters into publicity and expose the name of the two members of this brotherhood hitherto unknown in Europe and America. This was Master Moria and Master Kuthumi. Madame Blavatsky's life can be viewed as stages of the transformative psychology of the initiate. We will revisit stages of her life as a series of seven initiations in order to study the psychological and spiritual precepts underlying one of the most esoteric of esoteric personalities of all time. In this light, we view Madame Blavatsky as an exemplary cosmic personality, understood as an evolutionary template with a specific function. In the case of regularly initiated seers, it must be remembered that we are dealing with a long series of persons who, warned of the confusing circumstances into which they pass when their spiritual perceptions are trained to range beyond material limits and are so enabled to penetrate to the actual realities of things. Madame Blavatsky. First Initiation Birth and Early Years Helena Petrovna Vonhan was born at Ekaterinoslav in southern Russia at close after midnight on August 12, 1831. Her father was a captain in the horse artillery and her mother was a novelist and feminist who came from a highly placed aristocratic Russian family. Soon after she was born, she experienced her first initiation when her family had arranged a ceremony of baptism in an Orthodox Russian church consecrated with wax candles. According to A.P. Sinnott, a close acquaintance of Blavatsky, the following occurred at the baptism. As the ceremony was nearing its close, the sponsors were just in the act of renouncing the evil one and his deeds, a renunciation emphasized in the Greek church by thrice splitting upon the invisible enemy when the little lady, toying with her lighted taper candle at the feet of the crowd, inadvertently set fire on the long flowing robes of the priest. The result was an immediate conflagration during which several persons, chiefly the old priest, were severely burnt. This seemed some kind of omen. From the first years of her life, Helena displayed both a powerful will and unusual psychic abilities. As an adolescent, she studied piano in Paris and was an excellent musician and performer. When Helena was 11, her mother died of tuberculosis. From that time on, she was raised by her maternal grandparents in Saratov, where her grandfather was a civil governor. On a dare, at age 17, she married Nikofer Vasilievich Blavatsky, who was three times her age. Nikofer was also the vice governor of the province of Erivan in the Caucasus. Before the marriage was consummated, Helena ran away, first to Constantinople, modern-day Turkey. Second Initiation First Explorations Meeting the Master In 1848, Helena began ten years of travel with money provided by her father. 
Her travels led her to Turkey, Egypt, and Greece, Central Asia, India, North America, Central America, and South America, where she visited Mayan and Inca centers, Africa, Java, Eastern Europe, and Tibet. On her journeys, she said she longed to answer the recurring questions in her mind. Where, who, what is God? And whoever saw the immortal spirit of man, so as to be able to assume himself of immortality? She said she was most anxious to solve these questions, and so attracted to her masters of profound knowledge and mysterious powers. This shows the power of serenity and perseverance of a true seeker of truth. On her 20th birthday, August 12, 1851, in London, she met the master Mahatma Morya, whom she had had visions of as a child. Master Morya, a tall Eastern initiate of Rajput birth, told her of the great work in store for her. She immediately accepted fully his guidance. She would later say that the masters make themselves known only to those who have devoted their lives to unselfish study and are not likely to turn back. As an initiate, Blavatsky had an explicable need to explore the world and did so extensively from the ages 17 to 27, as epitomized by her crossing of the Rockies in a covered wagon from Chicago to San Francisco in 1855. This was a prelude to her second and successful attempt to reach Tibet through Nepal. She first attempted a few years earlier, but was met with unsurmountable obstacles. In light of these arduous travels, we must consider Blavatsky's personality. Strong-willed, bold, daring and directed from within, she followed her inner impulses by inexhaustibly exploring the outer world alone by steamboat, train, horse and camel. She exhibited a prime need to unify the different fields of human investigation to create a grand synthesis of multi-valued thought. She engaged in a search for common structures of meaning that entered into her vast realms of symbolism and symbolic expression. Her study of the esoteric doctrine was the most complete and most complex of all in the history of Western Chromaticism or Occultism. Third Initiation – Display of Power Madame Blavatsky returned to Russia in 1858, when she was 27. Here, she displayed many paranormal powers for her relatives and friends, including clairvoyance, telepathy and telekinesis. Her display of skills and the subsequent experiences were often accompanied by other strange phenomena, such as window tapping and bell ringing. After a mysterious illness, Madame Blavatsky resumed her travels through the Balkans, Egypt, Syria and Italy. At the age of 29, her mind started becoming more mystically attuned and her physical body went through many transformations. She endured cathartic illnesses that lasted off and on for around four years. During this time, she learned how to focus her will and tame the spirits and psychic energies that she so easily attracted. At the same time, she also developed and learned to tame her parapsychological skills. After her illness, she describes herself as being in complete control of her psychic powers. She was no longer at the mercy of outside or external forces. In 1866, she wrote the following in a letter to her sister. Now I shall never be subjected to external influences. The last vestige of my psychophysical weakness is gone. To return no more. Fourth Initiation Mystic Travels Encounters with the Masters In 1865, Madame Blavatsky traveled extensively through the Balkans, Greece, Egypt, Syria, Italy and many other places. In 1867, she joined the forces of the Garibaldi, fighting for Italy's nationhood against the French and Papal forces. She claimed to have received a strange wound near her heart in the Battle of Mentana in Central Asia. From time to time, the wound would open, leaving her close to death, yet she was able to continue her mission. Doctors were baffled by the strange wound that seemed to open and close without explanation. Some believed that her body was actually killed during this battle, but that it was resurrected to become a focal point for the power of her masters and hierarchy. In 1868, she traveled to Tibet via India, following the command of Master Moria. 
Here she lived and learned from her masters for three years, including Master Kudhumi. She lived in Tibet periodically for a total of seven years and claimed to have traveled to places in Tibet that were never visited by any other European. She describes this time. When we first traveled over the East, we came into contact with certain men endowed with such mysterious powers and such profound knowledge that we may truly designate them as the sages of the Orient. To their instructions we lent a ready ear. Much of the teachings found in my writings come from these sages of the Orient, our Eastern Masters. Many a passage in my works had been written by me under their dictation. In saying this, no supernatural claim is urged, for no miracle is performed by such a dictation. Madame Blavatsky claimed she had known adepts, not only in India and beyond Ladakh, but in Egypt and Syria. She says, adepts are everywhere, silent, secret, retiring, and who never divulge themselves entirely to anyone unless one did as I did, past seven and ten years as probation, and gave proofs of absolute devotion. I fulfilled the requirements, and am what I am. As Madame Blavatsky's life experience demonstrates, she, like any initiate, had to continuously work to master the lower forces. This is to aim of spiritual discipline and mandatory in the art of transformation. Without going through her cathartic changes, Madame Blavatsky could never have been prepared for the great work that she was to accomplish. This description summarizes the particular four-year phase, ages 29 to 33, in Madame Blavatsky's life. She had been appointed or designated by the higher force supervising the plan to be their singular unique agent for this time, an initiatic doorway for humanity. Through the example of Madame Blavatsky we see that the more we exert in the truth, the more our path is quickened, and we are purified much sooner than if we had not entered into a higher path of purpose. Once she had subdued the lower energies, Madame Blavatsky was able to fully embody the adept that Master Moria had told her was needed to found a new order, the Theosophical Society. Her sole purpose in this world was to be an agent to the masters who frequently communicated to her both physically and telepathically. When we speak of masters, we are referring to a specific matrix of energies incarnated in a select number of beings who function as guiding forces for the spiritual evolution of humanity. These masters are essentially accomplished beings that have already attained identity with and have been absorbed by their fifth dimensional higher self, such as the third dimensional self is most often purely apparitional. The manifestation of the Masters to Madame Levatsky was a singular grace shown to her only because of the profound responsibility that was placed onto her as a supreme initiate of the Herald of the New Age, or as Madame Blavatsky explains. We called them Masters because they are our teachers, and because from them we have derived all theosophical truths. For long ages, one generation of these adepts after another has studied the mysteries of being, of life, death and rebirth. By the training of faculties we all possess, but which they alone have developed to perfection, the adepts have entered in spirit the various superphysical planes and states of nature. Fifth Initiation Transition to Greatness the Theosophical Society. A great transition occurred in 1970 when Madame Blavatsky returned to Europe. Until this period she had spent her life traveling extensively and absorbing much occult knowledge. Now it was time for her to synthesize the great system of knowledge she had learned as it was practiced in the East. The mission given her by Master Moria in 1851 was so large that she was uncertain where to begin. She determined that she would first start acquainting the world with the latent potentialities in human nature. She did this by displaying certain psychic phenomena to a diverse range of people, in hopes to turning their attention toward the hidden sciences of nature. Her reasoning was, prove the soul of man by its wondrous powers, and you have proved God. As instructed by her masters, Madame Blavatsky arrived in New York City in July 1873. A year later, she met Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, 
would be of enormous help in grounding the vast vision into a coherent structure. Olcott was a distinguished Civil War veteran and lawyer who had a strong interest in spiritualism. His personality was precisely the catalytic energy Madame Blavatsky needed to concretize the mission brewing within her. On September 8, 1875, Madame Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society together with Colonel Olcott, William Q. Judge and others. The Theosophical Society became one of the most influential organizations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Its inception marked the first time in history that an organization opened a channel for the communication of ancient teachings regarding the nature of the universe and the phenomenon of the human mind in its course of evolution. In a note dated July 1875 in her scrapbook, Madame Blavatsky writes, Orders received from India direct to establish a philosophic religious society and choose a name for it, also to choose Olcott. Moria brings orders to form a society, a secret society like the Rosicrucian Lodge. He promises to help. Blavatsky, Collected Writings The Theosophical Society At its inception, the chief purpose of the Theosophical Society was to specifically investigate psychic and so-called spiritualistic phenomena. But the objective soon expanded into the following three chief objectives. One, to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste or color. 2. To promote the study of Aryan and other Eastern literatures, religions, philosophies and sciences. And 3. To investigate unexplained laws of nature and the psychic powers of man. Blavatsky's personal seal was the Ouroboros or serpent biting its tail which symbolizes a complete circuit that contains all knowledge. In Hindu cosmology, the serpent biting its tail represents the point of the Mahapralaya, Great Seed Time, when comes an avataric emanation to close the old cycle and regenerate the new cycle, preceding the Pralaya, New Seed Time. In other words, the beginning becomes the end and the end is the beginning. A few months after the founding of the Theosophical Society, Madame Blavatsky set to work on the writing of her first major work, Isis Unveiled. Isis is the symbol of nature and Isis Unveiled sought to establish the Hermetic tradition which remained active throughout many secret societies, drawing inspiration from Near Eastern traditions, Hermetic, Gnostic, Kabbalist, Sufi, Druzes, and later alchemical Rosicrucians and Masonic. For this work, she called upon the assistance of Colonel Olcott, who took a room on the floor above her at the Le Masary on 47th Street in New York. Olcott's task was to correct every page of her manuscript and to help her express her ideas that she could not frame to her liking in English. From this point on, the writing of Isis went on intensively and without a break until its completion in 1877. Olcott attested to Madame Blavatsky's claim that the material for the book was derived from the astral light of her masters. Blavatsky describes the experience in the following way. Space and time do not exist for thought, and if the persons are in perfect mutual magnetic report, and of these two one is a great adept of occult sciences, then thought transference and dictation of whole pages become as easy and as comprehensible as the distance of 10,000 miles as the transference of two words across the room. Olcott said that he never knew anyone who could be compared with Madame Blavatsky's dogged endurance or tireless working capacity. Keep in mind that at this time there was no manual nor electric typewriters yet available. Also keep in mind that English was Madame Blavatsky's third language. Russian was her first and French second, and she had only learned to write it three years prior. In his book, Old Diary Leaves, Colonel Olcott describes Madame Blavatsky's work style. To watch her at work was a rare and never to be forgotten experience. Her pen would be flying over the page when she would suddenly stop look out into space with the vacant eye of the clairvoyant seer, shorten her vision as though to look at something held invisible in the air before her, and begin copying on her paper what she saw. The quotation finished, 
her eyes would resume their natural expression, and she would go on writing until again stopped by a similar interruption. I remember well two instances when I also was able to see and even handle books from whose astral duplicates she copied quotations into her manuscript, and which she was obliged to materialize for me to refer to when reading the proofs, as I refused to pass the pages for the strike-off unless my doubts as to the accuracy of her copy were satisfactory. Sixth Initiation the public figure. Is it too much to believe that man should be developing new sensibilities and a closer relation with nature? Madame Blavatsky, Isis Unveiled. In 1877, Isis Unveiled was published as a two-volume series with more than 1,200 pages. It sold out the first day it was released. The New York Herald Tribune considered the work as one of the remarkable productions of the century. This perception was echoed by many other journals and newspapers. It is remarkable to note that in the first two pages of Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky refers to the Popol Vuh, the ancient Kiche Maya text, which was scarcely known about at that time. The first chapter of Isis Unveiled explains the cycles of nature, introducing the 71 Mahayugas and the four lesser Yugas, namely the Kali Yuga that we now find ourselves in. At this point, Madame Blavatsky's notoriety greatly increased and visitors flocked to her New York apartment, eager to meet her and witness her magical powers. Her personality was often described as bold and decisive, as well as cultured and courteous. Colonel Olcott described her mediumistic personality in the following way. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky would leave the room one person and return to it another. Not another as to visible change of physical body, but another as to tricks of motion, speech and manners, and with different mental brightness, different views of things, different command of English orthography, idiom and grammar, and different, very different command over her tempter, which at its sunniest was almost angelic, at its worst the opposite. After two years of working closely with Madame Blavatsky, Colonel Olcott concluded that she was actually a Hindu man. Putting aside her actions, habits of thought, masculine ways, her constant asseverations of the fact, putting these aside, I have pumped enough out of her to satisfy me that the theory long since communicated by me was correct. She is a man, a very old man, and a most learned and wonderful man. Of course she knows just what my impressions are, for she reads my thoughts like a printed page, and others' thoughts, and it seems to me that she is not dissatisfied, for our relations have insensibly merged into those of the master and pupil. Madame Blavatsky became an American citizen on July 8, 1878, and received much publicity in all the major newspapers. In December of that same year, after receiving instruction from her masters, she and Colonel Olcott departed for Bombay to set up Theosophical Headquarters. Many felt that her actions were nothing more than a whim, when in fact she was being guided by beings most cannot perceive. While in Bombay, she founded the monthly magazine The Theosophist, October 1879, dedicated to occult research. The society experienced rapid growth, with many notable members. In 1880, Madame Blavatsky and Olcott visited Ceylon at the invitation of leading priests and prominent members of the Buddhist community. Her fame had preceded her, and she and Olcott were treated royally. The monks who had read excerpts from Isis Unveiled insisted that she display her powers for them, to which she acquiesced. Colonel Olcott describes this time. Our rooms were packed with visitors all day. There was no end of metaphysical discussions with the aged high priest Bulatgama Sumanatisa. Old Bulatgama was particularly persistent, disputant, very voluble and very kind. Among other topics of discussion was that of the psychical powers, and Madame Blavatsky, who thoroughly liked him, rang bells in the air, made spirit raps, caused the great dining table to tremble and move, etc., to the amazement to her select audience. It was here 
in Ceylon that Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott took formal vows as Buddhists. Shortly after, they founded the main headquarters of the Theosophical Society in Adyar. Seventh Initiation – The Secret Doctrine While in India, Madame Blavatsky became mysteriously ill and the doctor expressed grave concerns that she would not live through the night. Some of her friends waited outside of her room and witnessed the sudden appearance of Master Moria. They claimed that he passed quickly through the outer room into Madame Blavatsky's room. The next morning, the physician was astounded to find her condition greatly stabilized. Madame Blavatsky's self-healing under the guidance of the masters is an inspiring and well-documented example of the taming of the lower forces. This type of experience is a deep shamanic initiation, a spiritual death and rebirth. Such an experience is often encountered when first entering a path of heightened awareness, or when first answering a call to a higher mission. This type of initiation calls for a process of increasing discipline to sublimate the lower psychic forces. In this process, it is important not to identify with the undesirable forces, but rather to recognize them as a quality of energy brought out through heightened discipline. These energies must be released and transmuted in order to pass to the next highest planes. After her recovery, she told her intimate friends how her master had come and given her two choices. The first, to die and pass on into peace, and the second, to live on a little longer and complete the secret doctrine, so that a few faithful souls seeking the wisdom might be enabled both to get the wisdom and to understand the masters. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky wrote the following of the experience in a letter to her friend A.P. Sennett. But I shall never, nor could I if I would, forget that forever memorable night during the crisis of my illness, when Master, before exacting from me a certain promise, revealed to me that he thought that I ought to know before pledging my word to him for the work he asked me, not ordered as he had the right to do. On that night when everyone expected me every minute to breathe my last, I learned it all. I was shown who was right and who was wrong unwittingly and who was entirely treacherous, and a general sketch of what I had to expect outlined before me. Black treachery, assumed friendship for selfish ends, belief in my guilt and yet a determination to lie in my defense, since I was a convenient step to rise upon, and what not. Human nature I saw in all its hideousness in that short hour, when I felt one of Master's hands upon my heart forbidding it to cease beating, and saw the other calling out sweet future before me. With all that, when he had shown me all, all, and asked, Are you willing? I said yes, and thus signed my wretched doom, for the sake of the few who were entitled to his thanks. Death was so welcome at that hour, rest so needed, so desired, life like the one that stared me in the face and that is realized now, so miserable. Yet how could I say no to him, who wanted me to live? But all this is perhaps incomprehensible to you, though I do hope it is not quite true. By 1885, Madame Blavatsky was the target of much slander and scandal. People called her everything from charlatan to fraud. A huge controversy ensued with the Psychic Research Society of London, who branded her one of the most accomplished, ingenious and interesting impostors of history. The tense and unpleasant atmosphere of India became unbearable, forcing her to return to London to continue her work. Since the time of the publication of The Secret Doctrine in 1888, the world population has quadrupled. Many of the technological advances that we take for granted today did not exist then, namely the airplane, automobile and computer. However, the signs of technological advance were everywhere, the Western European world as well as America, where agog over technology itself with a spate of world fairs displaying all the latest innovations. At this time, the Eiffel Tower, the world's tallest structure, was under construction. At this time, there was also a great deal of interest in advancement of electricity and electromagnetism. This is an important point when you stop to think about what electricity and electromagnetism connote, a type of etheric vibrant energy. 
Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, both genius pioneers in channeling this cosmic force, were deeply involved in occult work as well. Edison was an official member of the Theosophical Society. The Secret Doctrine was a profoundly well-structured text. Madame Blavatsky synthesized her perspective, which is the perspective of the Orientalist, the combination of esoteric Buddhist and the Vedanta Hindu philosophy. This perspective, underlying a work of such grand cosmic historical and scientific breadth, was perhaps the most striking and remarkable aspect of her works and character. There had never been anything like it in the history of human thought. It was truly global. The secret doctrine sheds light on the potentiality of the creation of a cosmic personality, according to divine and transcendental precepts that allow it to function in a multi-layered, multi-dimensional universe. The secret doctrine is a manifestation of Blavatsky's own complex and highly evolved personality. This synthesis of knowledge displayed in both Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine is a fundamental statement of the urge to you are, the post-historic spirituality. She was aware of virtually every mythological tradition that existed and synthesized them in such a way to illustrate the fundamental point that they were all derived from a previous root race, like one tree with many branches. These different traditions also point to the fact that we are entering into the fold of another root race. Dane Rudyar said of Madame Blavatsky, Even more convincing is the astounding character of the contents of her large books, especially the secret doctrine, which no ordinary mind could have produced without passing dozens of years studying and collating an immense mass of verifiable documents in many great libraries. At the same time, it is evident that Blavatsky, the woman, spent her life away from university and national libraries. In May 1889, Madame Blavatsky made a prophetic statement in her magazine Lucifer, in which she relates the role of theosophy in the world. If theosophy prevailing in the struggle, its all-embracing philosophy strikes deep root into the minds and hearts of men. If its doctrine of reincarnation and karma in other words, of hope and responsibility, find a home in the lives of the new generations. Then indeed will dawn the day of joy and gladness for all who now suffer and are outcast. For real theosophy is altruism, and we cannot repeat it too often. It is brotherly love, mutual help, unswerving devotion to truth, if once men do but realize that in these alone can true happiness be found, and never in wealth, possessions, or any selfish gratification, then the dark clouds will roll away, and a new humanity will be born upon earth. Then the golden age will be there indeed. But if not, then the storm will burst, and our boasted western civilization and enlightenment will sink in such a sea of horror that its parallel history has never yet recorded. The last six years of Madame Blavatsky's life were devoted to writing The Secret Doctrine, The Key to Theosophy, The Theosophical Glossary, The Voice of the Silence, and numerous articles. She died peacefully in London during an influenza epidemic on May 8, 1891. The Secret Doctrine and Cosmic History 2012 marks the 125th anniversary of the publication of The Secret Doctrine. Madame Blavatsky functioned as a planetary catalyst bringing forth a perspective and a base of wisdom that is anything but scientific materialist. Her belief was that materialism is and ever shall be blind to spiritual truth. Throughout her life's work, Madame Blavatsky sought to return to the most primary sources of thought and religion of the human race. Her perception was that the earliest stages of human thought are much closer to the purity of the divine order, the order that commanded our existence in the first place. This insistence on returning to the roots or origins is a necessary one, though it cannot be the entire focus. All cosmic history is a form of evolutionary spiritual psychology, and the secret doctrine as well as the introduction to cosmic science 
see Cosmic History Chronicles Volume 2, must also be viewed in this light. A spiritual psychology is necessary to bring the human mind back to its roots in order to see how and where it might have deviated, and from this comprehension of karmic error to create the image of the future evolved self. Synchrocosmology It is the purpose of cosmic history to comprehend and synthesize the universal histories, and it is the purpose of cosmic history to show the universal roots. The introduction of cosmic science and the secret doctrine provide perspectives and vocabularies which argument the purpose of the GM-108X mindstream. To synthesize the essence of these works, according to the formulations of the synchronic order and the law of time, is the purpose of the study of the secret doctrine and the introduction to cosmic science. What must be brought to light in an objective way is a structure of cosmic evolution, intelligence and mind that accommodates various vocabularies and perspectives in establishing a new science or knowledge previously unknown. This new science or knowledge is a type of synchrocosmology, meaning that the evolutionary path of the human mind is to synchronize itself with the different levels of cosmology that define those different perspectives. To do this in a way that might be useful for the educational program of the new human living in the new time is the final purpose of the entire study of cosmic history. To unify science, theology, cosmology and synchronometric science as a whole system, which defines the actual evolutionary psychology of the spirit, is to arrive at the most enlightened synthesis we can imagine. This is our goal. If you have read this far, then consider that you have taken a transport to the future of universal comprehension and are attaining a supermental condition of consciousness. This is the true end of the secret doctrine in all of its manifestations. It was Blavatsky's intention through the inspiration of Master Moria to create a grand synthesis of ancient wisdom. Theosophy means divine wisdom or the wisdom of the deity. In her cosmology, Blavatsky defines groups of builders and other spirit helpers such as the Dijani Chohans, who, like the fifth dimensional spirit guardians of cosmic science, the angelic guardians of the Quran, or the Mahabodhisattvas of Buddhic teachings, have no other intention but to assist the evolution of the spirit through its difficult human stage. For Blavatsky, to have propounded the Theosophical Society at a time when Western science was making breakthroughs in the fields of electromagnetism and electricity in general is remarkable. What Blavatsky was trying to communicate in one way was that the efforts of the scientists could only be incomplete for they do not take into account their own cosmic nature. Cosmic history affirms that only by assuming its cosmic nature can the human race evolve to its next stage. 7. Root Races The secret doctrine states repeatedly that everything visible and invisible in nature is septenary, which refers to a sevenfold nature. A key point in Blavatsky's elaborate cosmology is the role of the seven root races in the seven rounds of existence. She says that the whole of the cosmogenesis, the evolution of the cosmos, occurs in a sevenfold process of the seven rounds of existence round. Each round has a sevenfold division to it. In the fourth round occurs the human round. This recapitulates the ratio 4 is to 7 as 7 is to 13. Each root race is divided into seven sub races, and each sub race into seven family races. In cosmic history, this is known as the cave of 49 flames of the human being. Every form contains the image of its creator concealed in it. The seven root races are as follows. First root race, imperishable sacred land, Polarian Epoch. Second root race, Hyperborean, Hyperborean Epoch. Third root race, Lemurian, Lemurian Epoch. Fourth root race, Atlantean, Atlantean Epoch. 5th root race, Aryan, Aryan Epoch. 6th root race, according to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, this will evolve in the US. 7th root race, yet to come. 
According to this cosmology, we are currently in the fifth root race preparing for the sixth, to be followed by the seventh. Each of the seven races may overlap a subsequent race or division. According to the law of time, the sixth root race will begin to emerge in 2013. First there will be a quickening and then a full-on mutational shift followed by the closing of the cycle and then the opening of the new. The sixth root race corresponds to the cosmology of the Aztec Sunstone that transitions from the fifth sun to the sixth sun, from the sun of change to the sun of consciousness. The nature of electricity as a cosmic phenomenon was a major concern to Blavatsky as well as a key to the cosmology of the cosmic science. When we look at Western science, cosmic science and the secret doctrine, we see points of intersection. But in the case of Western science, a widely divergent view defined by a narrow materialistic scope and purpose. Madame Blavatsky's view of science is multidimensional, which obviously transcends contemporary science. This reflects her own personality, which is multi-layered with phenomenally multiple interests. In reading The Secret Doctrine, we realize what amazing comprehensive knowledge Madame Blavatsky possessed. The complete text conveys a feeling of longing for home or the experience of the entire universe as one cosmic rapture of primal unity. This longing is the mark of all great mystics and mystical seekers. Madame Blavatsky defines many areas of human interest or endeavor. As the two volumes of The Secret Doctrine demonstrates, these can be reduced to a cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis, the origin of the cosmos and the history of the origins of the human beings. In this regard, side by side with Cosmic History Chronicles, the knowledge book of Mevlana is the other great successor of the secret doctrine, defining the vast order of the intrinsic unification of cosmic reality in a grand hierarchy that almost defies comprehension. The transformative psychology reflected in the life of Madame Blavatsky and the understanding of her nature and character is also represented in the actual principles she describes in the secret doctrine, in particular the development of the different root races. The root races themselves are a very complex chain of events which describe a much larger process of a transformational psychology which spans the entire history of the cosmos. For Blavatsky, the form of history is a psychically repeatable phenomenon, which, using Hindu terminology, proceeds from a pralaya, a pause or seed time between two world systems or two world orders. This initiates a huge cycle known as a manvantara or a mahamanvantara or great cycle, which involves the elaboration of a root race. Each root race has its seven stages of development and sub-races that develop. We are now in the fifth root race. This means four root races have preceded us. These root races are related to the early psychomythic history of the earth, which she refers to as the four lost continents. The imperishable sacred land, Hyperborea, Lemuria and Atlantis. Each of these lost continents correspond to one of the earlier root races, leading to the present fifth root race. In Isis Unveiled, Madame Blavatsky talks about life on previous world systems, but in The Secret Doctrine focuses more on the history of the Earth, or the secret history of the Earth. The fifth or present root race is the one that is able to conceive of a higher spiritual level of development. The origin of the fifth root race is indicated to be the serpents and the dragons of the fourth root race. The serpents are those who initiate. She says that the serpent initiates keep themselves in caves and grottos beneath the pyramids. See Cosmic History Chronicles, Volume 2. The synthesis that Madame Blavatsky established in The Secret Doctrine, the principles of the lost worlds and the histories of the seven evolutionary rounds pertain to and establish the principles of a formative psychology of the construction of the cosmic personality, the chief focus of cosmic history. We must bring all the knowledge that exists to bear upon its relation to all its different parts. And then we must see how that knowledge sheds light on the previous worlds, the lost worlds. It is only in this way that a comprehensive and cosmic structure of the evolutionary personality may be realized. More than 130 years ago, 
when Madame Blavatsky wrote The Secret Doctrine, little was known about the Mayan civilization. This being the case, it is interesting to note that Madame Blavatsky not only visited the Mexican pyramids, but also called what little written work that was available at that time. She extracted the essence of the information about the one known as Botan from the few original Spanish sources, which she quoted in her books Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine. Both Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine mention the mysterious Botan. Isis Unveiled quotes Botan as being the greatest magician of ancient Mexico. This is astonishing to consider, since this work was written in the 1870s, more than 80 years before the discovery of the tomb of Pacalbotan. It is also interesting to note that the archaeologists who discovered and studied the tomb are loath to make any reference that this could be associated with the Votan, or that Votan might be none other than the great Pacal. Obviously, only a magician skilled in supernatural engineering could have determined how to build that stunning piece of interior architecture with the enormous pressure of the pyramid built on top of a crypt without caving in. The Secret Doctrine states, Seven families who accompanied the mystical personage named Botan, the reputed founder of the great city of Nachan identified by some with Palenque. In Bulberg's book, Botan, the Mexican demigod, in narrating his expedition, describes a subterranean passage which ran underground and terminated at the root of the heavens adding that this passage was a snake's hole, un agujero de culebra, and that he was admitted to it because he was himself a son of the snakes or a serpent. Page 379, Volume 2 Keep in mind that a second book burning in Chiapas in 1692 was intended to destroy all memory of Votan. This makes it most unusual that Brasseur de Bourbeur was able to piece together this information available only in the Guatemalan National Library. It is even more uncanny that Madame Blavatsky would have tuned into this information. Isis Unveiled states that Bulberg gives much information about magic and magicians of ancient Mexico. He says that Votan, the fabulous hero and greatest of all magicians, returning from a long voyage, visited King Solomon at the time of the building of the temple. This Votan appears identical to the dreaded Quetzalcoatl who appears in all the Mexican legends. Quetzalcoatl, plumed serpent, is of course another serpent initiate. It is also worth contemplating the fact that Votan is mentioned as the navigating serpent who would not tell how he got where he was going. Quote, but he, Votan, refused point-blank to afford any clue to the route he sailed or the manner of reaching the mysterious continent." End quote. The Secret Doctrine cites Votan as being a global traveler who was teaching Solomon around 600 BC and also indicates that he was descended from Noah. In one of the Guatemalan archives, Votan is said to be the 72nd generation descendant of Noah. Noah represents an archetype career of seed knowledge who goes from one root race to another root race, from one planet to another. The connection between Solomon and Pakalvotan is worth considering in light of the Quran. The Quran tells us that Solomon was able to train the jinn to do his work for him, creating large basins for statues and making many things out of metal. Jinn refers to invisible elementals and can also be interpreted as an alien or foreigner, like an extraterrestrial. The jinn are created out of fire, the humans are created out of clay, and the angels are created out of light. The jinns is titled of Surah 72 of the Quran and contains 28 verses. When Pakalvotan was 28 he entered his time of power, which coincided with the conclusion of the 72nd, 52-year cycle since 3113. The conclusion of the following 73rd cycle marked Pakalvotan's disincarnation. Sura 72 is preceded by Sura 71, Noah, which also has 28 verses. This number 28 is the bowed frequency for Maldek, the asteroid belt. 
This knowledge is a remnant of a mental perception or a memory from Maldek, transfigured into a remnant of a memory from Mars. Those memories of the moment that these civilizations were destroyed, whether by explosion or deluge or natural cataclysm, released the soul memories as fragmentary remnants. That is the scenario we are living today. Many Native American stories speak of ancestors originating in subterranean realm or taking refuge in caverns to escape past cataclysms and then emerging into a new time. Pakalvotan personifies or exemplifies the evolution of the spirit in its hierarchical possibilities. As an electrical fifth dimensional entity, Pakalvotan has the capacity of assuming an etheric fourth dimensional form whenever necessary often for the purpose of surveying world systems. He surveyed this present world system prior to taking a full-blown historical incarnation as the 11th ruler in the dynasty of Nachan Palenque, the earthly galactic Mayan Tolan. The purpose of Pakalvotan's mission on Earth was to establish the universal religion as the index of spiritual unification of the world systems. Following his disincarnation, Pakalvotan's fourth fifth dimensional form assumed a guiding function and toward the end of the cycle sent forth a final emanation. According to Blavatsky, the biggest deluge occurred 850,000 years ago, though there were later deluges after that. She says of Noah and the deluge, Noah floating on the waters in his ark, the latter being the emblem of the moon and Noah is the spirit falling into matter. We find him as soon as he falls to earth, getting drunk on the wine at the vineyard. His pure spirit becomes intoxicated as soon as he becomes imprisoned in matter. This statement indicates that Noah did not have a body when he first came to earth. This statement indicates that Noah did not have a body when he first came to earth, but once he got a body he made a vineyard to drink wine to alleviate the pressure of being imprisoned in matter. This is a clue to the unconscious factor of why the drug culture of the 1960s triggered so many lost planet annals. Blavatsky points out that many cultures have some recollection of this deluge, and many of those cultures say there were seven beings who survived the seven builders, the seven rishis, the seven tribes, or the seven families that accompanied Votan. Deluge and catastrophe are the punctuation marks between the development of the different root races according to the secret doctrine. This perception is similar to the seven evolutionary stages or sequences of human evolution found in cosmic science. See Cosmic History Chronicles Volume 2. As mentioned earlier, our present fifth root race represents the compounding of all the previous root races, according to the secret doctrine. According to the law of time, we represent the final complexification of all the previous stages of development. At this point, the human being is a hybrid mutant on the verge of becoming a superhuman or evolving into the sixth root race, capable of acquiring divine powers. However, we cannot embody the sixth root race until the fifth root race is purified. The serpent initiates point the way to the fulfillment of our evolutive psychology in order to develop a cosmic personality. With a cosmic personality, we overcome the memory fragments that are often mistaken as the basis of our personality. These fragments must be flushed out and transcended by means of the third force of intelligence. Cosmic History the conditioned personality is the remnant, but the essence within is the whole. The transformative psychology of spirit instructs us to exert in creating a rarefied field or state of consciousness that continuously dissolves or transmutes the fragments. The new evolutionary change begins with the conclusion of the cycle in 2012 and continues with the full emergence of the super-being after 2013. This superbeing consciously operates with the third, fourth, and fifth dimension. After these dimensions are integrated, then the superhuman and beyond can be reached. Once we reach the point of superbeing, 
the karmic tendencies greatly decrease, and by the time we fully embody the supra-being, the karmic tendencies give way to a consciously enlightened state. The example of Pakalvotan and the other serpent initiates is a reminder that the path is already laid out for you, wherever you are. Consider the following practical suggestions given by Madame Blavatsky for initiates in her pithy book, Practical Occultism. 1. Learn that there is no cure for desire, for the love of reward for the misery of longing, save in the fixing of the mind on that which is invisible and soundless. 2. A man must believe in his innate powers of progress. A man must refuse to be terrified by his greater nature, and must not be drawn back by his lesser or material self. 3. All the past shows us that difficulty is no excuse for dejection much less for despair, else the world would have been without the many wonders of civilization. 4. Strength to step forward is the primary need of him who has chosen his path. Where is this to be found? Looking around, it is not hard to see where other men find their strength. Its source is profound conviction. 5. The man who wars against himself and wins the battle can do it only when he knows that in the war he is doing the one thing which is worth doing. 6. Resist not evil, that is, do not complain of or feel anger against the inevitable disagreeable of life. Forget yourself in working for others. If men revile, persecute or wrong one, why resist? In the resistance we create greater evils. 7. The immediate work, whatever it be, has the abstract claim of duty, and its relative importance or non-importance is not to be considered at all. 8. The best remedy for evil is not the suppression, but the elimination of desire, and this can best be accomplished by keeping the mind constantly steeped in things divine. The knowledge of the higher self is snatched away by engaging the mind in contemplating with pleasure the objects, which correspond to the unruly sense. 9. Our own nature is so base, proud, ambitious, and full of appetites, judgments, and opinions, that if temptations restrained it not, it would be undone without remedy. Therefore, we are tempted to the end that we may know ourselves and be humble. Know that the greatest temptation is to be without temptation. Wherefore, be glad when it assaults thee, and with peace and constancy resist it. 10. Feel that you have nothing to do for yourself, but that certain charges are laid upon you by the Deity, which you must fulfill. Desire God and not anything that He can give. Whatever there is to do has to be done but not for the sake of enjoying the fruit of action. If all one's acts are performed with the full conviction that they are of no value to the actor, but are to be done simply because they have to be done, because it is our own nature to act, then the personality of egotism in us will grow weaker and weaker until it comes to rest, revealing the true self to shine out in all its splendor. 11. Do not allow joy or pain to shake you from your purpose. Until the Master chooses you to come to Him, be with humanity and unselfishly work for its advancement. This alone can bring true satisfaction. 12. Knowledge increases in proportion to its use, that is, the more we teach, the more we learn. Therefore, with the faith of a little child and the will of an initiate, Give your store to him who hath not wherewithal to comfort him on his journey. 13. A disciple must fully recognize that the very thought of individual rights is only the outcome of the venomous quality of the snake of self. 
He must never regard another man as a person who can be criticized or condemned, nor may he raise his voice in self-defense or excuse. 14. No man is your enemy. No man is friend. All alike are your teachers. One must no longer work for the gain of any benefit, temporal or spiritual, but to fulfill the law of being which is the righteous will of God.